Monsignor, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I wonder if uh, when you woke up in the morning, you thought that the best thing you could do on a Friday night in Erie was have attended a lecture on poverty and the measurement of poverty, but here we all are. So um, I, I wanna thank Ferkey, the Jefferson Society, Monsignor. Um, I wanna thank Congressman English. So I had the great privilege of working with Congressman English on the Ways and Means Committee uh, when he was a member and I was a longtime member of its staff, especially on the staff working on anti-poverty programs. Um, and I'm reluctant to admit this, but I at least am old enough to have worked on the 1996 welfare reform law. Mr. English, can he can account for his own uh, role in that. Um, so uh, here we are. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for, for being here. I'm going to um, run through Basically, I'm gonna treat you guys like members of Congress. So don't take that as an insult, Congressman, ignore that. Um, and I will give you, if I can figure out how to work the clicker. Let's see. Well, here. Let's do this the old fashioned way and try to go with arrows, if I can see. Can you tell me the right one? Oh, turning it on always helps. Okay. All right, now that we got that behind us. Um, so I'm gonna review, what is poverty? How do we measure it? What does poverty mean? Um, how has poverty changed over time? And it has changed significantly according to the various ways that we measure it. There's really interesting questions that relate to what happened during the pandemic. So uh, the federal government uh, initiated unprecedented amounts and specific programs to assist low-income individuals and all Americans during the pandemic. That had enormous implications in terms of what measured poverty looked like. Uh, and I'll talk uh, in some detail about that. And then ultimately, what, is this, what lessons does this all teach us as citizens uh, in terms of how we should think about these questions and, and what we should do from a public policy standpoint? All right. All right, so what is poverty and how do we measure it? Um, poverty obviously is about overall material deprivation. Um, it's not, you know, as, as a sort of broad issue, it's not about sort of individual things. You'll hear about things like food insecurity or energy poverty, things like that. This is a question of what resources do individuals in our society have and how does that compare with a threshold? What is defined as being in or out of poverty? And there's like a specific line and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's calculated and it's adjusted by, for inflation and by household size and it's a whole thing. But you know, the, the bottom line is for a long time, the United States has had what is known as the official poverty measure. And that is designed to answer the question, does an individual family have enough resources to basically put food on the table? And that's ultimately what the official poverty measure um, in, in its essence is about. Um, but it's about more than that. So um, we focus on important subgroups, uh, children, elderly poverty, differences by race and ethnicity. Um, there are important issues throughout what I will talk about tonight that get into questions about absolute versus relative poverty. Country has talked a lot in the last couple of decades about income inequality. Income inequality is important. It's not the same as the question of poverty, yet some of our poverty measures look more like income inequality measures than poverty measures. And those are important things to understand. Um, okay, so this chart shows the official poverty measure. Since it's government, of course, it's got to be official. And uh, it shows what, I'm sorry, there we go. The top chart is the number of individuals in poverty. I would encourage you not to look at that because the country has basically doubled in size over the course of the period of time uh, reviewed here. And look instead at the percentage of individuals in poverty. So that controls obviously for the number of, of souls in the country. Um, what this chart shows is that starting in the 1960s, the country seemed to make significant progress against poverty. And again, this is the official poverty measure. But then in the years since then, things have kind of leveled out. The gray bars mark recessions and occasionally poverty goes up in recessions and then comes down a little bit after recessions. But where we end up at about 11.5% in terms of overall official poverty for all individuals in the United States, looks pretty much like where we started in around 1970. So that's, um, that's an interesting chart. And it, it tells us, I'm sorry, it tells us a whole bunch of things. Um, it tells us that um, as it's reported, 
it's often regarded that this chart says that the U.S. has made relatively little progress against poverty in the last two generations. For example, the Wall Street Journal last month said this, the U.S. has made little progress in reducing measured poverty since the official rate fell in the 1960s. That dynamic, that things haven't really changed very much, says to liberals in America, hey, look, what we're doing isn't doing enough. We need to do more of it. It says, conversely to conservatives, hey, look, what we're doing isn't working. We should do less of it. These programs are a failure, and we need to basically jettison them. As we'll see, the real story is way more complicated than that. So I'll try not to bore you with too many of the details uh, of that. But meanwhile, what I will show you is this monstrosity. So um, I created this when I was still on the Ways and Means Committee staff in 2015. This displays all of the federal government's anti-poverty benefit programs. There are over 80. They have grown over time in an attempt, as we saw in the prior chart, to address poverty. So food stamps were created in the 1960s. Medicaid was created in the 1960s. Earning income tax credit was created in the 1970s. Child tax credit was created in the 1990s. Various other things happened along the way. This is um, the sum total of these benefits that's depicted on this chart is a trillion dollars in 2019. So before the pandemic, a trillion dollars was spent on that, more than the Pentagon, more than uh, the amount that's spent on, the, uh, uh, on defending the country. That's not counting the state side of these benefits, too. So these number, the trillion dollars is actually a lowball. But what the big picture here really shows is we operate a whole bunch of programs that are a confusing mess for state agencies and the federal government, which administers some of these, to administer. But more importantly, from an individual standpoint, imagine trying to navigate this. You're a low-income mom, and you want to go to work, and you want to support your family. Where do I go? What's the front door? What's the right agency? What are the combination of benefits that I should get? It's a very opaque system um, that has developed over decades with the best of intentions to help individuals, but here we go. Um, that has also fed lots of frustration um, that poverty, anti-poverty efforts are not working. We have 80 programs. Why are they not working? So there's a lot embedded in this, this figure. One of the key examples of this dynamic of growing anti-poverty benefits and the question of whether they're working is the example of AFDC. So AFDC was the anti-poverty program created in the New Deal by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, it was then called Aid to Dependent Children. Uh, the F was added some, somewhere later. Um, this doesn't go all the way back to the beginning, but what we see in the welfare rights movement and basically an explosion in out of wedlock childbearing in the 60s and 70s as sexual, sexual revolution was sort of going through the United States, the AFDC roles grew significantly. And then they sort of leveled off. Now remember, AFDC is a automatic stimulus plan. It's supposed to go up when recessions hit and go down when, when recoveries ensue. Doesn't really do much of that. Um, but what it did do in the late 1980s, after, ironically, Ronald Reagan signed a welfare reform bill in 1988, the FTC rules significantly increased. There's a whole lot behind that. Some of it was recession. Some of it was crack epidemic, the, all sorts of things going on then. But that spawned politicians like Bill Clinton, who was then a, the governor of Arkansas, who said, you know what? This system is not working. He's a Democrat who was arguing that the welfare system in America was not working because too many people were left dependent on benefits and not working. And Clinton famously said, we need to end welfare as we know it. He campaigned on that in part, and he won the presidency, as everybody knows, in 1992. For the next couple of years, he did everything but reform welfare, which actually created an opening for Republicans who, in the 1994 elections, campaigned on the contract with America that included as one of its planks reforming welfare. Republicans were elected to the majority in the House for the first time in 40 years in that election and held the Senate. And they proceeded to actually reform the welfare system to do many of the things that Bill Clinton um, ultimately, you know, initially said he wanted to do. Um, and in the end, Clinton signed that legislation into law. So um, here's what happened after that legislation was enacted. So. The peak of the welfare caseload, the AFDC caseload, actually occurred before welfare reform passed. The reason for that is because the states, as laboratories of democracy, were going through and operating waiver programs that tested various new ways of providing welfare benefits to make benefits more tied to work. 
So individuals would work, they'd have higher incomes, hopefully be uh, removed from poverty, that was the theory. That's how states were testing. All those experiments informed the policy debate in Washington and basically became embedded in the Republican uh, and ultimately Clinton signed welfare reform law that was signed uh, in 1996. That plan ended the AFDC program. So for you history buffs, there's never been a major New Deal program that was ever ended with the exception of this program. It didn't say we're gonna stop running any program at all. It completely replaced it with a new program called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. TANF, which is kind of a bad acronym, but uh, you know, it's government. So uh, the TANF program had a completely different design from the AFDC program that preceded it. TANF said to states which were administering these benefits, we expect you to engage low-income single moms, basically the welfare caseload, in work or other productive activities in exchange for benefits. We, the federal government, will give to states a fixed amount of money. So in contrast to the AFDC program that preceded it, instead of states receiving more federal money when more people were dependent on welfare checks and fewer people were leaving welfare for work, the TANF program reversed those incentives and said to states, if you're successful at helping people go to work, you get to keep the same amount of money that we have promised you before. So in terms of, just if I may, this is the level of federal funding that the TANF program set for its future for states. It locked in basically the record level of federal funding for cash welfare um, in American history, which gave states tremendous latitude, lots of leeway to do things like promote childcare so low-income moms could go to work, create state earning income tax credits, provide additional benefits, so that the law created sort of both a carrot and a stick approach of we want to help people go to work and we want to provide the means so that they can stay in work and they can support their families and lift their families, by the way, out of poverty. And this, I, I assure you, this continues to be an anti-poverty speech. So um, opponents of that, many in the president's, President Clinton's own party, said, oh, that's going to fail. There's going to be more kids in poverty. People aren't going to be able to succeed in going to work because families don't have the skills. They don't have the, the means, whatever their arguments were, and poverty is going to go up. It didn't. And this is the reason why it didn't. This shows the labor force participation rate of single women. The women with children experienced the sharpest rise in labor force participation during this period that I'm discussing, the period when states were experimenting with welfare reforms designed to promote work, and ultimately the federal government passed legislation that said in all states, this will be the way that we run these programs. And since then, we basically have seen no daylight between those two numbers. So this is a measure of Congress set a goal of promoting more work so that more people support themselves and are able to remove themselves from poverty, and it actually worked. This is a rare, such a rare sight uh, in these sorts of, uh, 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 you know, uh, discussions. But so sort of, you know, kind of take that in for a second. Everything Washington does doesn't always fail. Sometimes Washington will actually come up with something where it says, "Hey, we want to achieve a goal. We're going to change the rules and have them pull in that direction." And by the way, there's cultural things going on at the same time, you know. Um, all sorts of things were pulling in the same direction that resulted in this um, improvement that we see. So now take a look at the effect of that on poverty. So this is child poverty rates using three measures of poverty. Let's look at the top two for just a second. The top one, the dark line, is the official poverty measure. Now look at from like 1996 to 2000. In that period from 95, I'm sorry, 95, child poverty under the official poverty measure, and I'll get into to other poverty measures in a second, fell from 20.8% to 16.2%. Five years from 95 before welfare reform to 2000, 22% decline. As the last slide showed, rising work and earnings by parents meant those improving child poverty rates. Overall, poverty, according to the official poverty measure in 2000, matched record lows from the 1970s. Poverty rates for African-American families, female-headed households, both disproportionately likely to depend on welfare benefits before, reached the lowest, lowest levels on record. So that's a strong measure of improvement. Obviously, after that, we had 9-11, a little bit of uh, you know, the recession after that, and then the, the spike that you see in the official poverty measure in starting about 2007, 2008, 2009 is 
uh, the Great Recession, and then since then it's it's gone down again. So um, we've seen some significant improvement there. One thing that's really important to understand is that is only a very partial picture. So the official poverty measure counts earnings and it counts the most cash-like government benefits that are paid to individuals in this country. So think social security checks, welfare checks, unemployment checks. It misses basically where taxpayers have been and policymakers have been focusing increasing attention on other types of benefits. So this chart shows in blue the types of benefits that are counted towards the official poverty measure. And those are things like um, welfare checks as I described and then supplemental security income which is a low income kind of welfare-ish benefit program for disabled individuals. What it misses is the red. And the red shows how since the 1960s and especially in the 1980s, 90s, and since then, Congress has been designing benefit programs that aren't counted as income towards the official poverty measure. Some of these things are not counted towards the next poverty measure I'm gonna talk about, but things that are important like food stamps, earned income tax credits, child tax credits, they provide some families with five, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a year in combined benefits that are ignored under the official poverty measure. So what that really does is it increasingly underestimates our progress in reducing poverty in, in the United States. All right, so logical question, what if we actually counted that stuff? And the answer is, well, the government has since come up with a plan to do that. Um, and um, it's called the supplemental poverty measure. The Census Bureau developed this second measure uh, in 2011, and it counts more of those in-kind and tax benefits that I, measured, uh, that I mentioned, especially food stamps, child tax credit, earned income tax credit. But importantly, the supplemental poverty measure doesn't stop there. It is, first of all, it's a mind-numbingly uh, complicated measure. It actually has thousands of poverty lines because it varies by state and uh, you name and household size and all that. Um, so it's extraordinarily complicated. Um, but one of the real failings uh, of the supplemental poverty measure is it's a relative measure. So instead of answering the question, are you able to put food on the table? It answers the question, how are you doing compared with your neighbors? And in a country like ours, where blessedly progress continues, growth continues, the country becomes richer over time, our neighbors tend to be doing better. So if you design a a policy like this that says, we're not going to ask, are you in poverty or not, but rather we're going to ask basically about income inequality. That's going to answer a very different set of questions. So the answer to the, what if we counted those growing benefits, turns out to be really complicated because the measure that counts those growing benefits has all sorts of other things going on. So um, this next slide shows the supplemental poverty measure, which I said uh, began about a decade or so ago compared with the official poverty measure. The blue line is the supplemental poverty measure. Now, logicians in the room are immediately asking themselves, how is it possible that you can have a poverty measure that shows a higher poverty rate under the supplemental poverty measure when that benefit, that, that, that measure is counting all those of additional resources? And the answer is because the supplemental poverty measure, actually, as I'll show in a second, raises the poverty, th poverty line. So it does, it, basically creates a, a higher target to hit. Um, let's see. Um, so what that really reflects is what you count matters and what your target is really, really matters. So, uh, and don't worry, we will get back to the changes at the very end during the pandemic in just a second. So this figure is from my colleague, Kevin Corinth at American Enterprise Institute. And it shows the poverty thresholds for the supplemental poverty measure, the dotted line, versus the official poverty measure. And as I said, you know, again, as, a, as the country gets richer, not surprisingly, if you have a measure of income inequality as your target, the supplemental poverty measure creates an ever higher poverty threshold that nominally uh, taxpayers should try to help people exceed. Um, the official poverty measure grows because of inflation primarily, but this is really one of the, one of the complexities, I would say, of the supplemental poverty measure that make it not a fair thing to swap in for the official poverty measure as some uh, members have wanted to do. And that's not an idle question. Um, the Ways and Means Committee, actually the subcommittee Mr. English served on, had a hearing this week, the topic of which was 
folks in the Biden administration thinking about swapping the supplemental poverty measure for the official poverty measure. So if you want to create an engine for making it increasingly difficult to solve poverty in America, at least on a calculation basis, this would be the way you would go. And that is a problem, especially in a world where the left, I would say increasingly, um, suggests that government is really the solution to helping people exit poverty, as opposed to promoting more work and earnings like the 1996 welfare reform law promoted and has promoted for in the decades since. If you go with something like a supplemental poverty measure, ultimately it falls to taxpayers to develop bigger and longer and you know, more aggressive benefit programs to solve the issue of poverty. So one of the other things, and Congressman English I know will uh, immediately gravitate to this, that makes the supplemental poverty uh, measure really complicated and, and really problematic, I would say, is because it considers relative housing costs, it would significantly move where we understand poverty to be in America. This chart, the green, and the darkest green is California, shows places where more poverty would be understood to exist under the supplemental poverty measure. And the red, so here you have uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, um, Kentucky, West Virginia, the Dakotas, um, would be places where poverty would seem to go down. So the prospect of swapping out the official poverty measure for the supplemental poverty measure is not an easy one. If you think of the United States Senate and think that money will follow these criteria, all of a sudden you have a massive food fight on your hands. And that is something that is very unlikely, I think, to pass muster in the Congress, suggesting that the supplemental poverty measure has some, you know, some really serious issues um, with basically design and ultimately um, it's, it's uh, potential of, um, of being swapped in for the official poverty measure as some would like. Let's talk again about the pandemic. So look at the tail end here. So under the supplemental poverty measure, um, during the pandemic, as federal taxpayers provided massive amounts of support for everyday individuals, but also anti-poverty benefits and you know, unemployment benefits, you name it, the supplemental poverty measure that tended to count those went way down. And then of course, when the pandemic expired and those temporary programs um, ended, as even President Biden suggested they, they needed to, poverty gave the appearance of going way back up. Under the official poverty measure, it's kind of flat. And the reason is because what gets counted. So one of my lessons for you all is Pay attention, there's a lot behind all this stuff and people have various agendas behind what, they, what poverty measure they use and how they argue these issues. But during the pandemic, federal government provided $700 billion in unemployment checks. Uh, that's $600 increases, extended benefits, a whole new program for, uh, for independent contractors, self-employed individuals and all that. Counted under the official poverty measure, counted under the supplemental poverty measure but then a whole slew of other benefits, even larger in some cases, were only counted under the supplemental poverty measure. So stimulus checks, average family of four received $11,400 $11, in stimulus checks uh, during the pandemic, $150 billion increase in food stamps, plus the underlying amount of food stamps uh, provided. There was a major expansion in the child tax credit uh, uh, provided during the pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the federal government gave money to the states, which then turned around and provided other tax credits, only counted under the supplemental poverty measure. So again, that's how you see one poverty measure dropping dramatically and then snapping back, and I'll talk about that in a second, and another one showing hardly any change at all in a pandemic, right? When unemployment spiked to 14, 15%. So, all right. So not surprisingly, washed through the media, this message, um, creates significant confusion. New York Times headlines say it all. The New York Times, which for years had pointed to the official poverty measure when the Census Bureau releases its annual poverty reports and says, you know, hey, poverty hasn't really fallen, what's going on, things are bad, you know, whatever their arguments were in those headlines, switched and during the pandemic referred to the supplemental poverty measure to make this point of capturing more benefits, which I think is part of the reason why there's interest in switching from the official poverty measure to the supplemental poverty measure, which, like I said, is complicated and has, has a whole bunch of issues. 
So in 2020, when the first of the pandemic benefits were paid, New York Times headline said U.S. poverty fell last year as government aid made up for lost jobs. Again, depends on which measure you use, but they were correct if you use the supplemental poverty measure. 2021, more pandemic benefits were paid, including the expanded child tax credit. Pandemic aid cut U.S. poverty a new low in 2021, the Census Bureau reports. Then when those purposely temporary benefits initially bipartisan, so the CARES Act in March 2020, voted on by Republicans and Democrats, and then in 2021, Democrats supported the President's American Rescue Plan that expended benefits, created this temporary child poverty, or child tax credit. Poverty rate soars in 2022 as aid ended and prices rose. So if all you know is this headline, the 2022 headline that appeared in the New York Times in September of this year, because there's a little lag in how we get this stuff, you would think, oh my God, things are terrible. How could this possibly be in the greatest country in, in, on earth? You have literally headlines that's, that said the number of children living in poverty in the United States more than doubled in 2022, according to new figures from the Census Bureau. Now, they credit this to, um, it was widely expected because of the expiration of the enhanced version of the child tax credit. It's not actually completely so. Everything else ended too. And in fact, stimulus checks had an even bigger effect in terms of reducing poverty than the expanded child tax credit. But this tells a tale because there are policymakers who will use this and run with it to advance their political agenda. So let's, um, let's look again at the bigger picture on child poverty. So what we see here is three lines. Like I said, the oh, that's, that's not gonna work. What we see is the The dark line is the official poverty measure. The kind of grayish line is the supplemental poverty measure. The blue line is actually something called the consumption poverty measure that was developed by um, colleagues uh, of mine at the University of Chicago and the uh, and, uh, University of Notre Dame. Um, if you look at where we ended up in 2022, so the most recent data that we have, and you compare that with before the pandemic, and then you look all the way back, you would think that instead of number of children in poverty doubles, as the, one of the previous slides showed, you actually would see that child poverty in the United States has reached its lowest level ever, with the exception of the pandemic when these extraordinary benefits were paid. So um, that is an important point, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The consumption poverty measure goes at this a different way and asks about what individuals consume. What are they able to purchase every month to support their needs? If you look at that, and I, this, is, this gets into a lot of detail, I will encourage you to go to the web and uh, check out the reports and all that, the picture is even more positive. It shows a continuing improvement in the last generation or two in the amount of individuals in poverty in the United States. That's not the kind of story you often hear when we're talking about poverty in America but it happens to be more supported by the facts once you really understand them and get behind them than the headlines that you might read from one year to the next about child poverty doubling or you know, pandemic aid expiring and, and uh, everything is, is looking terrible. So what are the lessons for you as interested citizens? I would say there's three. Um, first, it's that this is all, if I haven't already convinced you, uh, it's that this is really complicated stuff. There is a lot going on here, and it involves government experts in places like the Census Bureau and you know, people that devote their careers and lives to this stuff, and it's hard to sort of break through the fog. Um, few people, and I congratulate you, would actually willingly sit through a presentation like this. I would, I would venture many members of Congress have never sat through this level of detail when it comes to the poverty measure and what's going on uh, with it. So kudos to you for withstanding this uh, and, and, and trying to understand this stuff with me. Politicians and the media, another uh, uh, lesson is they often pick measures that conform with their policy goals. So um, I talked a little bit about the child tax credit. Um, the child tax credit was significantly expanded in 2021. It was expanded for only one year in a bill supported only by Democrats and signed by President Biden because they wanted to minimize the cost and they thought, oh, if we see this program, if we get this program out there, everybody will insist that we continue to run it and keep it going. Turns out that's not what happened. The American people actually were very skeptical of that. They were skeptical of the fact that that benefit as it was provided in 2021 removed the work requirement 
the, the work expectation that had been associated with the child tax credit going all the way back to its creation in 1997. So President Biden, when he had a majority in the House and Senate, couldn't convince his own caucus to extend the child tax credit. He had issues with Joe Manchin, he had issues with, with others, but it was often on this question of what's the nature of this benefit and should it be payable to individuals who aren't working? Uh, which is contrary to how the child tax credit has been paid throughout its, its, entire, uh, its entire duration before. Um, but you will see, as we saw with New York Times headlines and the Time story, some people will try to puff up the expiration of that benefit, which again proceeded because Democrats designed it that way, and say, aha, child poverty is terrible in America, it doubled, we need to revive the child tax credit. In fact, ironically, Michael Bennett, senator from Colorado in June, at a period of time when the president was making a big deal about Bidenomics and how swell the economy was going, and you know lots of people are skeptical about that because of inflation, and, you know interest rates, and, and you name it. But the White House was saying, "Hey, talk about Bidenomics and how great the Biden economy is." Michael Bennett, who's a big child tax credit supporter, said the current economy was savage because it didn't include the expanded child tax credit. So again, another example of how politicians and the media and various others will look at these things and make arguments proceeding from policy and use things like poverty measures as sort of leverage to uh, advance their, their policy arguments. Um, and f I think the third lesson is, fortunately, the longer term picture is much more positive than we are often led to believe. Um, it shows slow but steady progress against poverty, especially when more benefits the taxpayers provide are counted. So like I said, the supplemental poverty measure has a whole lot of flaws, but one thing it does is it actually counts more benefits the taxpayers pay. As a taxpayer myself, I think that's essential. People should know that what they provide actually has an effect. And from a policy standpoint, we should know when those things work and we should keep doing the things that are working and not do the things that are not working. Um, we obviously haven't solved poverty. I don't want to you know, make that argument. It's, it's clear there's, there's too many poor people in America. We have lots of problems. There you know, are, are major issues. But that picture is the kind of thing you don't often see people talking about in Washington um, because I think they, they often try to use this issue to argue for this or that benefit expansion that they would like to, that they would like to um, uh, provide. All right, so a couple of final thoughts. The lessons don't stop with poverty. So um, if you're really, really fascinated, I hesitate to bring props, but I brought a prop. Um, this is a book by Phil Graham. Uh, you might remember him, former senator from uh, the great state of Texas, and several colleagues who worked at the Department of Labor called The Myth of American Inequality. It runs through all of these issues about what the official numbers count in terms of benefits paid, and sometimes don't count in terms of taxes that individuals pay towards questions like inequality. So poverty has these issues, inequality has these issues. For the seniors in the room, there's retirement security uh, issues. So again, uh, this is from my colleague, Andrew Biggs. He says that the common view of retirement income is simply Social Security and 401ks. In reality, US seniors draw income from a wide variety of sources. Projections of retirement income addicts we see need to take all those sources into account. So again, what matters is having a full view, having a full understanding, and that is a challenge, I think, to you know, us as citizens, it's certainly a challenge to policymakers, um, and it's also a challenge to understand when sometimes policymakers might try to pull the wool over your eyes, um, which I would say there's always that sort of backstory in Washington, and, you know, it's complicated to, to sort of get to the bottom of these things. So let me close with this. I've kind of made it sound, um, I think with sort of the exception of the discussion about work and uh, work requirements and things like that in, in welfare, that individuals are somewhat kind of um, subject to these broader forces when it comes to poverty and there's recessions and, and all that. That's not really the way this works in the United States. Um, we, have, um, we have infinite possibilities uh, in this country and you know I think my, my children are uh, benefit from that and hopefully everybody else's children benefit from those opportunities. But much of what results from your life and your decisions result somewhat from what you're taught and then how you, uh, how you respond to those things. Scholars at the Brookings Institution, left of center institution, came up with this uh, a couple of decades ago. One of them is Ron Haskins, who um, worked with Congressman English and, and me on welfare reform policy. And they came up with this 
this basic view of the nature of poverty in America called the success sequence. The success sequence finds simply that if you get a high school diploma, if you work full time, marry before having kids, your chance of being poor in the United States as an adult is less than 3%. So um, if individuals do only two of those things, so 90% follow the first two steps, graduate from high school, work full time. Um, I'm sorry, 90% of those who uh, follow the first two steps of graduating from high school and working full time are not poor in their 30s. So even there, with lots of complexity, lots of cost, childcare, you know, I don't envy single parents, all that, poverty is, is relatively low. So individuals, to some degree, at least, have it within their control to determine their fortune. And that's what we want. What we should have, I would say, is government policies that promote those good decisions. There are charter schools in New York City serving majority minority kids who teach the success sequence to their children. And those schools are sought out by those parents because they recognize the power of that message for their kids. Um, government policies, like I said, can, can amplify that. So education policies that put parents in charge of decisions about where kids can go to school, technical education, community colleges, the things that we were talking about before are all important. Continue to expect and reward work and work in, in concert with these types of benefits, tax credits that support work, that make work pay, as President Clinton said, um, are really important. And then there's actually penalties against marriage in the tax code, various government benefit programs. Addressing those to the degree we can can make that more likely, that two parents can be raising a child instead of one. And you know the math is pretty elemental there. So let me close on what is hopefully a relatively positive point there, and I look forward to our further discussion questions. As I uh, get set up here for a moment, how about another round of applause for Matt Weidinger presenting tonight at the Jefferson Educational Society Global Summit. Matt, thank you so much. And, and, and of course, uh, thanks to, to our congressman in connection to this event, Phil English, and, and to our sponsors for making this possible. And, and folks, to you, to coming out, you're, you're better than Congress. You sat through this presentation. I think that's the first question. How do we get Congress to sit a presentation like this. I would guarantee if this was a room of members of Congress, you could second this, half of them would have left to take a call <laughs> <laughs> or meet with staff or never showed up in the first place. So, Matt, I'm going to remind you to use your okay, mic. Um, and, and yes, I didn't see anybody taking calls in the hallway and pretending to look busy, and you were all paying attention. I think it's great. And I think because you were all paying attention, you're going to have excellent questions. Whether or not you have excellent penmanship, will be the answer of whether or not I can ask your questions. So that is what I ask uh, from you to be able to do that. Matt, I want to go back because I think one of the hallmark takeaways for me is just the complexity of this and the multiple layers in us to get to understand this. Why doesn't government count all of the anti-poverty benefits? Let's go back to the, the official poverty measure. Why don't they count everything in that measure? So. Some of this is just sort of historical happenstance. So the, the main things that are not counted in the official poverty measure are things are programs that were created in the wake of the beginning of the official poverty measure. So the official poverty measure sort of looked at what government programs are as, the, as it founded and said, well, okay, we'll count these things. But it didn't anticipate that the tax code was gonna start being a major engine of anti-poverty benefits, which, is, which really is what it is. Um, by the way, the stimulus checks that you got came from the IRS. Um, child tax credit, earned income tax credit come from the IRS. These are tax benefits that are much like Social Security, other things. They just happen to be paid by the IRS instead of HHS, Social Security Administration, you name it. I would, I would suggest that in some sense that's not really uh, a coincidence. I think policymakers in D.C. have come to understand that calling these sorts of benefits, which are, you know, checks, tax cuts, makes them seem more bipartisan, makes it easier to sell. So it's a kind of timing issue, um, but their growth 
is in part because of the marketing for those benefits. So this is my word, not yours, but it seems almost like it's outdated. You know, that perhaps it's not a system that's caught up. And on the other hand, we have supplemental poverty measure. Would you favor adopting that and we use that as a lead metric? So I, I think that would be flawed. I don't think it's going to happen, including because of the, uh, the sort of US chart that I showed. Uh, it's, it's a little difficult to imagine the country agreeing that more poverty exists in California, significantly more poverty exists in California. In fact, the number of people in California who are newly understood to be poor matches the number of people in Mississippi who are newly understood to be not poor. I don't think we're gonna adopt that, and I can tell you for sure, the legislators and senators in places like Mississippi and you know other places that are sort of the, the blue ones in that chart would uh, look askance of that becoming the official measure. I kind of think about where we are and where we are headed Sort of like baseball statistics. So I'm a baseball guy. When I was a kid, you had the you had RBIs, home runs, batting average. Now you have all these crazy statistics about you know on base plus slugging and wins above replacement and all this other stuff. I I think our future is headed in that direction. It would be useful for policymakers to offer basically two official poverty measures. One that continues to ask this question of the most cash-like benefits. Kind of keep doing what we've been doing keep answering that question. So we kind of look and see, okay, what's going on in recessions? How much does unemployment matter? How much does Social Security and, and, uh, and that matter? But then add to that more of the stuff that taxpayers have decided to provide since then it would give you a more accurate depiction of where they are. So the problem with that is, as the parties view that, I think on the left, there's great reluctance to do that because it would show what the figures, what the consumption rate that I showed is, um, it would show that poverty has significantly been reduced. They would argue, oh, the poverty line is too low, we need to increase it, let's use a supplemental poverty measure for that. They rarely get into this additional detail that supplemental poverty measure is this relative measure that basically makes it increasingly difficult to actually eliminate poverty if we wanted to set that as a goal. So. Um, I kind of view the future as likely a hybrid. We're gonna probably have multiple measures, which I apologize in advance. It's gonna be really really confusing to read New York Times headlines and try to figure out which poverty measure they're referring to in this year's headlines. So again, that's kind of your chore as citizens to kind of look behind those and actually understand what's going on. So I think this room full of great scholars now knows to think about that. I wasn't thinking about that myself before that, of what measure are they using when we're reading these headlines? What do we lose in terms of knowing where our neighbors stand when it comes to the accuracy of well, which measure are they using and how does that make sense to how I'm understanding the conversation around poverty? When you see headlines that are out of whack because they're not using the same measures. Right, yeah, I, I, I mean, the answer is we lose a lot because we lose we lose an accurate understanding. I think to some degree we lo lose some trust in government, right? Because this is so confusing. There's so much to this. It's so hard to understand. It kind of promotes this sort of games playing of, well, let me pick the poverty measure and use that to describe the current conditions because that poverty measure counts the benefit that I want to see more of. And that's, you know, we, we don't need more reasons to have cynicism about the federal government in this country. You know, you would figure that poverty measurement would be one of those things that would be relatively straightforward. Turns out it's really not. So here in the United States, we're using multiple metrics. What metric do we use when we're comparing ourselves internationally and how many metrics are there out there internationally? I, I know I'm probably complicating this beyond what you expected, but I, that gives me fear that when we think of where the United States stacks up against other countries, how are we measuring? How are they measuring? How can there perhaps be a global one page that we're all on? Or, or maybe we're there already and the US has to catch up. Um, so we're not, and the international comparisons oh, are really complicated. Um, inter foreign, uh, Europe, for example, tends to focus more on questions of income inequality. So the official poverty measure being an absolute measure seems dated to them. Um, let's see. The, the reports that attempt to compare the United States with European countries, for example, will tend to say, oh, the U.S. is seriously lagging when it comes to its efforts to reduce poverty and poverty is higher and all that. In part, that's because the United States focuses 
more money on certain things that European countries don't focus money on and that, by the way, don't tend to be counted. So Medicaid, very large expense, very large support for low-income individuals. Medicare, not counted. Um, in the United States, we spend relatively more on that. So in some ways, it's really not a surprise that the United States tends to lag because our focus is on other things and we spend more resources on other things. So I want to go back to that slide that showed the 80 plus programs and, and I think a lot of us were wowed by that. Um, and, and I want to ask, is it a reduction of programs, an umbrella to oversee them all? What, what do you see a pathway forward that would make sense of what currently exists that gets us to a better system. And before you answer that, I, I want to remind the audience, we're taking your questions too. So uh, you likely got an in index card and a golf pencil on the way through. We're going to take questions that way. Our team will be coming through to collect those or to give you an index card and a golf pencil if you didn't get one. I want to make sure that we get your questions uh, asked and answered too. Uh, so if you have one, just hold it up. Our team will come around and collect those. But back to that question of what do we do? Do we reduce the number of, of programs that are out there to simplify it? Do we create a bigger umbrella to hold them all together and manage it? Or is it something else? What do we do? So um, I'm not even sure you're aware of this history. So when Republicans took the majority in 1994, Ron Haskins asked the Congressional Research Service, to look at the total number of federal programs designed to assist low-income individuals. Turns out there were 336. We dropped about half of those uh, that were education and training programs in the late 1990s, but you know, we obviously still have a zillion programs. The vision that Republicans had in 1996 was, consider the eight domains of those programs. You look at the chart, there's eight colors. They're for things like health, cash, food, transportation, you name it, on down the line. Create a system of block grants so that states can get control over the money in those domains and states will be given broad targets. Reduce poverty, increase work, promote earnings, help people have two parents in a household, whatever those broad targets are, and say to the states, look, you figure out those goals. You figure out how to achieve those goals. As I described the AFDC to TANF transition, we actually kind of resolved that issue in one of those eight domains. So what remains is the rest of that chart if Congress wants to go there. Now, here we are 27 years later, um, and Congress hasn't gone there. And one of the reasons is because these are federal programs that are designed by policymakers in Washington that sit on committees that change the rules from time to time and take ownership of them and think that they're really great. And in some, in some cases, in some cases they think they're terrible. But there's a lot of institutional inertia that keeps those programs in place where they are. It takes, literally, it was a, a electoral and policy revolution in the 1990s just to change one of those social domains to create the TANF program that replaced AFTC and had better results in terms of work and reducing poverty. Um, I, I think there's great promise for the other ones, but there's also really strong reasons why Congress doesn't tend to go there very often. Well, speaking of Congress, so when we started the Global Summit on Monday, and I had a chance to talk to Peter Baker, the House didn't have a speaker. Here we are at the end of the week, and I know this is an unfair question because government can move fast, and it's moving this week. A question from the audience says, do you really think our current Congress can deal with the issue of poverty based on legit data? So current state of Congress, what do you think the temperature is in terms of addressing it? And then to the audience question, can they deal with the issue of poverty based on legitimate data. So let me answer this on a very uh, transactional level. I don't anticipate major changes in the next year and a half, right? You have a divided government in Washington. The divided government tends to not produce great change. Um, can Congress make these sorts of changes? I'm, I'm kind of a pessimist. I mean, the, the recent experience suggests Congress looks at major problems, and with the exception of when there's a crisis, and a big spending bill moves through that may include some significant new benefit program, often temporary, some you know, expansion and unemployment checks, whatever that would be, Congress hasn't tended to make major changes. Let's say Obamacare is probably the major exception in the past generation or so. But what Congress has tended to do is pass things like a very large Obama stimulus package in uh, February 2009. That happened to occur two months after, or literally a month, I think, after the president took office. 
Joe Biden gets elected president in uh, 20, he takes office in 2021. March 2021, American Rescue Plan spends $2 trillion on the administration's priorities. That's what Congress tends to do. Um, one of the real interesting dynamics about that is, though, instead of choosing one or two permanent things to change, the American Rescue Plan changed a whole bunch of things for just one year at a time. Child tax credit is a good example of that. So policymakers tend to they tend to sort of load all of their stuff in a bill and then figure, oh, we'll worry about extending that or what comes next in a later bill. And often they don't tend to have that opportunity. So I, this, and this is something that occurs on both sides. Republicans did this with the tax reform law under President Trump. Um, that sort of carried the weight of their social policy shortly after the president, um, that President Trump took office. So uh, it's kind of a pox on both their houses, but that sort of short-termism and one, you know, once in a lifetimeism. What Rahm Emanuel said, uh, kind of infamously said, you know, a good crisis you don't want to leave to waste. You should use the opportunity to do things you couldn't do before. Congress tends to do that, and it does it, I think, in a really unenlightened way. It, you know, these things always explode the deficit because they happen in a recession or a crisis, and then they stop. And then you get these sort of crazy dynamics, like I showed about the supplemental poverty rate going down going back up, and then when it goes back up, because that's how legislators design these policies, they complain that poverty just went up and we need to revive them, even though they had that opportunity when they were originally designing the law. So, so I wanna talk about some of the, the ways to address it. One of the things you talked about at the end of, of your presentation is the impact of uh, quality education. Uh, tonight's sponsor is a, a medical school. We've also got folks from United Way uh, in, in the room tonight. Uh, addressing poverty with the Community Schools Initiative, and, and we've seen the impact here since it launched in, in 2016, um, and it continues to span. So I, I'd like to go a little deeper on the, being able to speak to the role of a high-quality public education that really plays a role. Is that still you know, one of the strongest pathways? What do you see that's working? What do you see that isn't working when it comes to public education breaking a cycle of generational poverty? Well, so... I mean, what doesn't work is shutdowns and keeping kids out of school. I think we, we have uh, more than established that. Um, there is, I think, some cause for optimism here in terms of educational choice programs uh, that are taking root around the country where people can have more options available to them, including some things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. Um, I am actually kind of confident that public schools are going to be able to compete with private schools as those programs roll out. Um, I speak as a parent who sent eight kids through our local public high school, and a bunch of them went through Catholic school earlier on. Um, so we've seen kind of both sides of this coin, um, but it's, it's a decidedly good thing for parents to have more options to figure out what the best educational situation is for their kids. And like I said, in some cases, it may be a very value-based education that's, uh, that's different. It, like I said, in, in New York City, there are charter schools that obviously focus on language and science, math, you name it, they also have a heavy values component, including because parents are seeking that out. They want reinforcement of their values of education, work, family, and so forth. An another audience question is looking at social gains connected to, to poverty, wondering if we are making long-term progress in our fight against poverty, are there social gains that you've seen in your research uh, that might be connected with lower poverty? So, um, you know, poverty is a, um, it's a material question, right? But the social side is critically important. Um, I think some of our recent experience is unfortunately confounded by the pandemic. So we have seen rates of suicide, drug abuse, you know, kids checking out, kids failing, kids not uh, proceeding in education. Um, and I, I, you know, that's, that's very troubling. Um, in terms of social gains, there is tremendous value in people working. I remember I was actually at the Rose Garden when, when Bill Clinton signed the welfare reform law, and he, had, he was accompanied by a, a young mother from Arkansas, and she spoke and said the best thing for her from welfare to work was the example that she set for her children. And there's tremendous power in that. And we now have, we have programs that are pulling in the direction of promoting more work, but we also have other programs that are subsidizing more work. And those are good things 
that accrue to the long run best interests of kids. There's all sorts of research in DC, and we can talk about UBI and, and all that, that just say, well, just give people checks. Those things shortchange Americans, and I think they, short, they, they undersell what people really want. They want to support themselves. They want a hand with that. They don't want the government to substitute for their support. So I do want to ask about universal basic income, but I'll, I'll, I'll say truth to power, at least uh, recently locally here, I had a chance to interview Dr. Ken Louie, who's in the, in the back, the economist at Penn State Barron, for an article I, I wrote for the Erie Reader. And we we're talking about Erie's economy, still 3% behind pre-pandemic standards, U.S. economy about 3% over, but we're getting there. And I, I'd asked him, you know, what what's the number one thing we could do for the economy? And it's jobs, 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 is, is what Dr. Louie had told me. But back to universal basic income. What are, what are your opinions of it? Should we pursue this? Would this help address poverty, eliminate it more quickly, or eliminate it at all? So um, there's a lot there. There's, there are literally dozens of UBI, universal basic income, or guaranteed income uh, tests going on around the country. Um, I think the promoters of those programs really aren't after the continuation of local programs. What they want is the federal government to create a UBI program uh, in, into the future in perpetuity. Ironically, we actually participated in two UBI programs during the pandemic. Stimulus checks were paid to 85% of American households. They cost $850 billion. That's more than the Defense Department. Uh, and I think I may have mentioned that the average family of four received $11,400 from that. Now, clearly, that would have an effect in terms of reducing poverty. Might also, some scholars uh, have done research on this, reduce individuals' inclination to work, right? If you pay somebody a check, that now is not conditioned on working, some people will respond. The, I'd say the rosy view of this is that individuals will then use that opportunity to go back to school and then be able to unlock a higher wage. I would like to believe that, that was the case. But we sort of ran a UBI-like program before, and it was known as AFDC for low-income single moms, produced very little work, very little education, long dependence on benefits. So, you know, applied across the, the economy, that I think it, it, there's a cautionary tale there because of our history and what we know in terms of the improvements since then, but then also the cost. So um, let me just do one little quick segue. Kamala Harris, when she was still a senator, produced a pandemic UBI bill. I encourage you to go look at this. It was uh, introduced in May of 2020. It proposed that every, every family in America have, or every individual in America have $2,000 a month in checks from the federal government for the duration of the pandemic and three months after. Up to five people per household could receive those checks. So what she was literally proposing was the federal government send $120,000 a year to families of five, or 100 and 100, uh, wait, whatever the math works out, that you know, a lesser number to a family of four and on down the line. The cost of that is just amazing. So if you, if you did that in perpetuity, the annual cost of that is twice what the federal government spends on all benefit programs today. It's $6 trillion. Over the course of what she proposed, whether she realized it or not when she was initiating this, she would have spent $21 trillion. American Rescue Plan, which many people believe contributed to where we've been in terms of inflation, was $1.9 trillion. We have our national debt now is like $33 trillion going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So, you know, there are big ideas afoot in the UBI space. Many of them are totally unhinged from reality. So this wouldn't be a global summit if we didn't have global questions from our audience, one of which is asking, what do you think of the Nordic model of welfare? I'm here to learn about that. I know nothing. Tell me. So um, a lot of people presume the Nordic model of welfare is rich benefits uh, paid to individuals and high taxes. Sweden, one of the Nordic countries, is moving in the other direction. Um, they have reformed their benefits to be more about work. The, the, the labor shortages that we see, which are broadly driven by demographics, are present in other countries as well. And so countries have looked at this, and over time, Nordic countries, the Netherlands, even Germany to some degree, have reformed their social welfare systems to try to get more people to work and off of benefit roles. So Netherlands had pretty robust uh, disability benefit reform. Um, Swedes, I think I just saw that they actually so not surprisingly, lots of refugees have gone to Sweden. Um, they uh, just raised the earnings requirement for individuals to come into the country from out of the country because they want people to come to, for work and they want to help them work, not to come to, to depend on the social welfare system. 
So there is a Nordic system. It's often presumed to be this sort of lush package of benefits. Many of those places are finding that they actually have to dial those things back, including because they need to have workers as well. And the, the benefit systems actually compete against work. So what kind of program in October of 2023 would it be if we weren't talking about the election of 2024? Of any of the Republican candidates, uh, either the presumptive nominee or the others still in the field, does anybody have a plan to tackle poverty that's caught your eye? Um, Tim Scott talks about these issues a fair amount. Tim Scott was one of the uh, gentlemen that was um, promoting opportunity zones. Uh, he has a very compelling personal story, raised by a single parent, talks a lot about work, uh, so he uses his positive example to talk about these issues. I would say none of them have a particularly robust set of policies that I've seen. I think uh, Donald Trump has sort of sucked much, most of the oxygen out of the room when it comes to policy discussions, and policy discussions in the Republican primary seem to boil down to, you know, uh, where are you vis-a-vis -vis the latest travails of President Trump? Um, so uh, unfortunately, there's not a robust debate going on. There is some discussion about things like the child tax credit. So child tax credit, um, like I said, was expanded temporarily in 2021, but and that temporary expansion went away. It was also expanded in the Trump tax cut law of 2017. That will expire in 2025. So instead of a $2,000 per child, child tax credit, it's going to drop back to $1,000. So that kind of seeds the discussion of at least when it comes to the child tax credit, of what individuals want to do. Um, and there are, there, I would say there are, um, let's just say Trumpier Republicans who are more interested in providing um, more assistance to lower income individuals, including individuals who may be not working as much um, compared to other sort of more traditional Republicans when it comes to how that child tax credit is reauthorized when the time comes. So there's a little bit of a debate on the right about that. There's a lot of debate on the left about that. And most of the debate on the left is, hey, how soon can we recreate that 2021 expansion? Because we really love that policy. So let's talk about the minimum wage for a second. We have several audience questions asking about this. So for minimum wage, should this be something continue to be set by the states? Should states have jurisdiction over their minimum wages? Should this be a federal standard to come in and raise the minimum wage? Do you favor raising the minimum wage? So I'll just answer the first part because I think it answers the second. Um, I think states should figure this out. States are very, very different. And you know, you don't have to trust your uh, former advisor or Republican members of Congress on this question. Democrats in uh, relatively low wage Southern states, Terry Sewell um, from Alabama, I would say, um, are very leery of the federal government setting a minimum wage because if the federal government's minimum wage is above the level that's the market rate in Alabama, well, you know, it's not going to work out very well for the people in Alabama. Um, so I, I, this is a great big country, and the same way that it makes sense to give states more control over federal benefit programs, you know, subject to broad targets of promoting work and reducing poverty and, and those things, I think the same applies on the minimum wage side as well. So this audience question is looking at your position on uh, federally funded school lunch programs and breakfast programs. Again, some states uh, taking initiative, some not. You know, should there be a federally funded school lunch program, breakfast program? Uh, there, there is. I don't think we're going to get rid of it. It's not something I pay a whole lot of attention to. It was um, many of the issues here involve whether it's universal or not, um, and it was universal during the pandemic. I think some of those universality policies are, are fading away, but I will confess to not being the all-time expert on that particular one. Position on SNAP benefits. So um, the SNAP program, if I showed you a chart of what the SNAP eligibility looks like, so SNAP's the, most people uh, know as food stamps, SNAP has dramatically expanded. Um, and I think in part, SNAP has expanded in place of what was AFDC and TANF to some degree. SNAP is an open-ended entitlement. It's 100% federally funded. So it's not like AFDC used to be, which was 50-50-ish with the states. It's 100% federally funded. The states are all for SNAP expansions. They're all for bigger SNAP benefits because they regard it as sort of like stimulus coming into their states. People get money. That makes them better off. It also helps grocers and you know the local community and all that. So states will never turn down SNAP money. The number of individuals on SNAP, I showed you the AFDC caseload going down. There were 
14.4 million individuals on AFDC in 1995. There's something around two to three million. I think it's close to, it rounds to three million today. Um, that has been more than replaced by the expansion in the SNAP caseload since the 1990s. So, um, you know, again, this is, this is complicated, but um, there are large and growing federal benefit programs. SNAP is probably the primary example um, that support individuals. Often, you know, SNAP has, has had from time to time, when it's not waived, when it's not accepted, uh, a work requirement. But for many individuals, there's no expectation to work in exchange for SNAP. That contributes to rising caseloads. And the Biden administration, by the way, by executive fiat, dramatically increased SNAP benefits during the pandemic. So, and that continues. So there, the SNAP program is a big program. It has grown significantly. If it were me deciding it, and I didn't work on the Agriculture Committee or help members with the Agriculture Committee decide these questions, I, I think it would be useful to have more expectation that individuals do some, something in exchange for SNAP benefits, like with TANF. That would result in more people working and, and getting training and doing other things that will advance their lives. But that's not the way the program functions right now. So another great audience question, and uh, as we're nearing the end, if you have one you've written down that hasn't been collected, try to get it sneaked up uh, through one of our team members, and we'll try to get to it as we uh, near the end of our time together here. This one is asking us, Matt, help us understand uh, race inequality in America. Uh, this person says 13% of Erie County identifies as BIPOC community, 50-plus uh, percent uh, are in housing crisis. Are results different based on race? They are. Um, I, 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 there's no way to sugarcoat this. I mean, the national data confirmed this. I'm not, uh, I'm, you know, I defer to others uh, who are ERI experts. Um, all sorts of things differ by race. Um, wages, relative unemployment, uh, family structure, nature of household, all those things. And all those things matter. And I think that is a special challenge for the country because um, in designing programs, we need to understand and meet people where they are. I think it, it's, it's inappropriate to, to say, oh, well, because of your race, or where you live, the you know, amount of unemployment in your area, that you, you can be given a pass from doing the things that everybody else does to work and support themselves. It's appropriate to say, well, what additional help do you need to overcome those barriers? Um, so I, I'm reminded when we were passing welfare reform, there were amendments that said, if you live in an area where unemployment is above 8%, you would not be subject to a work requirement. Now, remember the work requirements in the welfare reform law say you have to go to work or you have to participate in education and training or search for work or do things that are sort of work-like. I can't think of it something that would be worse for low-income communities than to say, oh, okay, well, forget it. You, the people who happen to live in your area are the ones that can continue to see benefits without having some sort of reciprocal obligation for that. Number one, it would result in people migrating there if their only goal was to receive benefits, but it really just sort of writes people off and says that people are incapable of participating in the American dream. And I, I think that shortchanges them. So we have, there are major issues, recognize there are significant differences by race and ethnicity, um, but that just means there are special challenges there to address. So I, I appreciated that toward the end of your, your presentation, you were, you were giving us some, some cause for hope and optimism. So in, in, in the years that you've studied this, what makes you the most hopeful that we are tackling poverty in a productive way? And, and conversely, what's still keeping you up at night when it comes to what the U.S. is doing to address poverty? Yeah, um, a lot of things. One thing is that's really, if, if, we were, if we were having this global summit in the early 1990s, we would be talking about out of wedlock childbearing, because especially teen out of wedlock childbearing was going through the roof and was contributing to some of the like really bad data that we saw. The country, I think for mostly cultural reasons, and you know, you throw in birth control and things like that, has made enormous strides. I mean, this is on the order of the campaign against smoking in America, in terms of a reduction in the out of wedlock birth rate among teens, especially. Out of wedlock birth rates remain high, they remain high, unfortunately, in, in in you know, significant numbers in some communities. Um, but at least teen childbearing, which was really the hardest problem to tackle, you know, for, for obvious reasons, has really abated. So that's one thing that I would say is significantly better. Um, the thing that still keeps me up at night, I would say, is we have committed, no offense, Congressman, policymakers, Gene Sterling, you probably know Gene Sterling, um, has, he talks about dead men ruling. 
what he means by that is policymakers, lawmakers, going far back in time, all the way back to FDR, but then important changes made in the 1960s, 1970s, that expanded benefits for especially retirees in America have done tremendous work in terms of reducing elderly poverty. But we have committed so much resources to those programs, and we are, many of you have retired, I'm gonna hopefully retire someday, we will be drawing on those resources as we go. And those programs depend on, basically in the past, they have depended on a growing number of workers to pay payroll taxes to support those benefits. As those number of workers coming behind us is relatively smaller compared to the people receiving benefits on the other end, something's gotta give. And you know, people get all agitated about cuts and benefits and things like that. The, the flip side of that is, younger generation will have to pay relatively higher taxes. And so you think about sort of competing priorities, cost of housing, childcare, all those other things. As we go forward, not only will we have to navigate all of that, but the squeeze on these low income benefit programs, often for families, right? Families with kids, because those are often the ones who are in poverty, especially while children are young because of costs and inability to work and things like that will become ever greater. That's a problem. I don't think we have addressed that. We, we have failed to, we've hopelessly failed to address the sort of Social Security and Medicare crises that everybody has known are sort of looming ahead of us. I don't think hardly anybody has paid any attention to the sort of, you know, the, the sort of spin-off effect in terms of our ability to do what we need to do to help families who are gonna be the ones that ironically are really gonna have to bear the burden of the elderly entitlements that we've committed ourselves to. So. And I heard childcare in that mix, and that's one of the last questions that came up here for the audience. We just have a few more I'm going to ask you, and that's in, in what a great question, because the JES's Civic Leadership Academy is addressing uh, childcare. You know, what to do about that uh, as, as a group. Uh, they're studying that, looking for an answer, how they can improve that here in Erie. And this person's asking, how can we expect people to work? And we've said jobs, 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 get people working. That's the solution. How can we expect people to work if we don't provide affordable childcare? So um, there's actually relatively large resources that the federal government provides and states provide uh, for childcare. I, I would also note one sort of undervalued aspect of the welfare reform transition is the money that the federal government committed to continue providing to the states for whatever the states wanted to spend it on. Welfare checks, transportation to help people get to work, state income tax credits, childcare benefits. Much of the money that states were able to save by not paying as many benefit checks to individuals because more were going to work was devoted to childcare. So it doesn't always have to be that we need to figure out whatever the number is today and double it or increase it by something or whatever. Sometimes the solution can be, hey, what are we doing today that if we redesign things, we can give states some flexibility to focus on exactly childcare or whatever, you know, in the guise of another program uh, they want to focus on. Um, I'll, I'll finish with one other thing. So um, a colleague of mine and I wrote a report, and it's kind of long and boring. It's in something called tax notes. If you're really, you know, having trouble sleeping at night, go, go to that. Um, but we, we did sort of this thought experiment. I've talked a lot about the child tax credit. Currently, child tax credit is $2,000 per child um, per year available for 17 years. So $34,000, pretty healthy commitment of federal resources for families to help raise their kids. But naturally, $2,000 doesn't go very far. What my colleague and I suggested was, what if the federal government said to somebody, hey, look, instead of giving you $2,000 times 17 years, why don't we, get, why don't we let you take $17,000 times two years? And now, if mom or dad wants to work part-time, they can, and they can raise their, their children themselves. Um, if you look at surveys, of consumers when it comes to the question of childcare, very large number, surprisingly large number of individuals really aren't interested in third party, you know, out of home childcare. Many people want the wherewithal to raise their children themselves and step back from work, have more flexibility with work, work part time while the kids are young. And these are all very understandable things. So again, some of this doesn't necessarily have to mean whatever taxpayers are paying, taxpayers have to provide more so more can be provided in these benefits. Some, sh some of the answers should be, look to the benefits that we already provide and ask, are we doing this the right way? Because sometimes the same money can go a longer way if you meet people where they are. 
So we started this with, uh, you've all heard more than perhaps many members of Congress have, having sat through this. The last question I'll, I'll ask you, Matt, is that uh, if you had Congress's ear and you could tell them just one thing, or I, I think maybe put another way, if you have people sitting here who have a congressional representative and have friends who live in other districts who have congressional representatives, what's the one thing that they might relay to their representative when it comes to answering big questions like, can the federal government eliminate poverty? But before I ask you that question, I do just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, you've been incredibly thoughtful, wonderful audience, and of course, a big thanks to uh, those who make all of this possible, including the JES team under the leadership and direction of our president, Dr. Fergie Ferrati, and, and Jake and Raven and Chelsea and, and Christine, our wonderful interns, our, our wonderful volunteers, our board of trustees uh, that empowers us to do this, and of course, sponsors for the Global Summit, including tonight's uh, LeCom Health and the many others uh, that we'll talk more about when you all get a break tomorrow. But Sunday, we're right back in session, uh, and, and chairman of the Global Summit, Steve Scully, is coming into town for that one, so do not miss it. Uh, David Urban talking about the future of the GOP, uh, what the future of Pennsylvania politics looks like in the state of the race, of course, because it's 2023 and we have to talk about 2024. So that's kicking off on Sunday. We have a whole slate of programs all that week, ending on Thursday with Tom Nichols, contributing writer for, for The Atlantic. So again, thanks to you, thanks to, to our sponsors, our team. Now, Matt, to that question, if you had the year of Congress and there's one thing you could tell them, or perhaps some out here could be a vehicle for your message, what's the one thing? thing they need to know. So um, first thing, if you're talking to a member of the House, congratulate them on having a speaker. Because <laughs> as we've learned, these things shouldn't be assumed away. Um, you know, I, I think I would refer back um, to what I said before. Try to resolve the big questions when it comes to the larger entitlement commitments that the country has made. Because, you know, we can we can have a debate about how much we can provide in terms of the child tax credit this year, right? Um, in the long run, those questions, those sort of immediate questions, will be swamped if we don't come up with a way to reconcile the rising commitments the federal government has made across the board with our inability to pay for those things. You know, somehow it's going to be because of inflation, interest rates certainly will go up, all those things will impact Everybody, it will impact poor people the most. Poor people are harmed the most by inflation. They are harmed the most by high interest rates because they can't afford housing, and that you know gets sort of um, reflected throughout their throughout their experience. So unless we get those big things right, and like I said, I'm not seeing the public pressure to get those big things right. We're never going to be able to resolve these these other issues, and these other issues will come under increasing stress as we go and make it increasingly hard to do the right thing by kids. Mr. Matt Weidinger, thank you for sharing your time, talent, knowledge, and expertise with us here at the Global Summit in Erie, Pennsylvania. A round of applause for tonight's presenter. Thank you all.